Hello and welcome to 40 Guard Live. I'm Derek Mankey and joining me again, it's good to great to see you as always, Amar, in 2022. How are you doing, Amar Lagani? Hey, happy 2022. I am doing wonderful. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. Yeah, I'm doing great. We're off to an interesting start, as is always the case, right? But I wanted to uh, flash back a little bit to the end of 2021, um, since it's still relevant, as we often find with these big campaigns, and that is, of course, all eyes on Log4j. Um, there's a lot of coverage we did on this from the initial vulnerability breaking, uh, the threat signal, our, our 40 guard um, outbreak protection coverage, which shows our whole security fabric and mesh architecture, how that's all protecting against that. That's all well and done, right? But as we progress over the holidays, of course, there's a lot of things unfolding. And I wouldn't say surprising, but this is the, the new reality, right? We talked about advanced persistent cybercrime before, that whole world of cybercrime really playing on these fresh vulnerabilities. And that, that definitely was true. We saw so many different campaigns that started attacking these, these new vulnerabilities, each one as they rolled out. Because um, we had the initial remote code execution of the big CBSS 10, of course. Then we, uh, you know, we had all that coverage within 24 hours in response to threat signals and our outbreak. Then as time unfolded, as the weeks unfolded, we had, we saw two more DOS vulnerabilities uh, released. We saw reports of a wormable Mirai uh, IoT botnet, um, in including the, the Log4j remote code execution payload. Thankfully, we confirmed it wasn't, you know, through a great re research block that we released, it wasn't wormable and we haven't seen that worm yet, um, fingers crossed. Um, but, you know, the latest one was on arbitrary code execution, and we're still seeing protections since then. So it hasn't gone away, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, first of all, I always get a lot of people asking me, like, you know, you know, what do threat hunters do as, as a cybersecurity specialist? What really is threat hunting? And first of all, Log4j, I, I, I'm going to say this for a while, is it's going to be the gift that keeps on giving. First of all, I would tell you, like, follow the Log4j coverage. You can see even from Fortinet's own research, kind of our mindset on how we actually discovered, uh, you know, what the vulnerability, what kind of impact it had in certain environments, what kind of impact it had for our customers, how we protected against that vulnerability, like the things that we brought to the table, and then the, what we had to find out, like, and you can kind of, you can kind of, like, go through that as a map, and you can use that. Log4j was great coverage for a lot of security companies, and I say that's, it's a good exercise to go through just in threat hunting now just to kind of proceed and what you said about that is yeah we saw log 4j from an attack perspective really take off as soon as that vulnerability was released all of a sudden you have proof of concepts that are pretty easy to do you know it's a, a one line piece of code uh you saw like all these hits coming in from uh different telemetry that we had uh, from our own honeypots from our ips signatures uh we saw a lot of activity out there and then we started seeing a drop and you're like, well, what's going on? Are people not interested in this anymore? And that's not the case because like what happens is you see a little bit of a drop. You feel, uh, if someone goes back to the, to the, to the well, I would say kind of figures out a little bit of tweaks and then you see a spike again and then you start seeing a drop again. And most likely what you're starting to see is people are taking advantage of other exploits of other vulnerabilities that have, that you can discover or kind of tag on or chain, as we say, chain exploits upon the original vulnerability. So that is why I say it's going to be the gift that probably keeps on giving in 2022 because that software is so prevalent and so widespread in so many different, not only in Log4j, but in so many different types of applications. Yeah, and I think it really, it really, uh, you know, paints a picture of the new reality that we're in that when these break, uh, these significant security events, that window is shrinking. We saw that, right, in terms of how quickly. In fact, it was 80, just over 80 minutes from the initial, I think on December 9th, from the initial uh, proof of concept being posted that we saw a C2 botnet command control callbacks using this, right, and, and pings. And, like, it's, it's, it's real. Like, these things happen quick. It really shows for security operation centers how important it is to pay attention to these as they break in terms of mitigation, remediation, strategy, patching, of course, because those patches were going, like, wildfire right i mean vulnerability released uh you know exploit code patch new vuln patch right and that kept on going in cycles and really important to stay agile and, and uh attentive to that thing too right yeah and I, and I think we're also seeing a little bit of a pattern um and this has happened a couple of times is when you have a vulnerability that's released you have a patch but the patch is not always a hundred percent it's kind of like targeting that that big hole that wildfire that's going on and then like you know there has to be a little bit more 
catch up almost in the intelligence space on exactly how the exploit is working or how people are taking advantage of that exploit. And so there's usually another patch or another update afterwards. And I think we're going to continue to see this. And so people have already had a very hard time patching and staying up to date with software. Unfortunately, I believe it's going to get a lot worse or get a lot more difficult or uh, people have to at least be a lot more deliberate about patching. Yeah, but the good news is from everything we put out, and by the way, uh, you can go watch this. We did a corporate webinar with Fortinet on this. We have a whole bunch of resources, including threat signals you can find on FortiGuard.com. And of course, our, our research blog on blog.fortinet.com. But it really shows that whole evolution. And it, it's again, this is going back to history. What it's taught us is that we always see copycats happening, right? Copycat campaigns, new attacks that are happening, uh, not just with, you know, we saw crypto miners and ransomware and, um, you know, remote access trojans, all of those coming together uh, on this. But we also saw, uh, fast forwarding now to uh, the first week of January, we also saw H2 now with the JNDI interface, another application using JNDI interface uh, and another security flaw that was unearthed with that. So it really goes to show also when there's this, it's this ripple effect, right? You talked about the waves. That's certainly true in terms of attack activity that we see, but also with these vulnerabilities and, um, you know, uh, people trying to find similar, you know, uh, vulnerabilities to unearth too, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, once again, what, what did the log4j do? Well, it used um, the the class, right, JNDI, right? That's That was kind of like the, um, the, the main function behind, uh, you know, what attackers were taking advantage of. And so, of course, attackers said, hmm, I wonder if this function, so if Log4j, you know, finally what they did was they were like, you know what, let's go ahead and just remove this function from our software. We're, we don't even really need it. Uh, that's probably the best way to take care of it. Probably, you know, probably not a bad way of thinking about it. And what, what did attackers do? They're like, okay, is this function used in any other applications? And can we like use it the exact same way or in a very similar way? And of course, it's used in a lot of other applications. It's Java, right? Java is used everywhere. So that and so they started looking around for where else is this going to be used? You know, even even as researchers on the security side, on the on the defensive side, we do the same thing. We're like, oh, we see this vulnerability and this this action. You know, can can these same types of actions be used somewhere else like should we protect against that i mean that's that's almost a functionality of what how we build neural networks and machine learning to like catch those types of vulnerabilities but even on a more basic level just as researchers were looking for the same types of things and of course attackers are looking for the same type of attacks as well yeah and, and you're right we are seeing detections uh, it has there definitely was a peak running up to about december 28th and there has it has been subsiding since but again looking at all the big campaigns in the past even the microsoft exchange happening vulnerabilities these these all came in waves right and so i think another wave is coming it's really similar to the pandemic isn't it right we see a, a wave an initial peak and then a drop and then all of a sudden a new campaign new variant in this case uh that really drives a lot of that activity so i i, I agree i fully expect that to to, to be coming in the uh weeks, if not months to come, um, we're still seeing, going back to that reference I made, the proxy log on vulnerability side, we're still seeing activity and it's been almost a year into that, right? Uh, so I think you're right, this is gonna be here uh, for a while. The other thing too is now uh, we have a lot of other things to look at. It's not just about Log4j, right? Uh, we so Microsoft just dropped the latest, uh, latest patch Tuesday. I think there was over 90 different CVEs. This was a monster one, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, one of the first patch Tuesdays that comes out of the year, um, like you said, over 90 different vulnerabilities, like I think almost 96 vulnerabilities that uh, that came out that were that were being patched. And, and uh, of course, uh, a, a lot of attackers are looking at all these and are thinking like, wow, look at all these vulnerabilities that are being patched. I wonder how many people are not patching and what can I take advantage of? Yeah, yeah. And it's sort of a good news, bad news scenario, right? Because in this case, obviously the whole idea of patch Tuesday is that this is, these are patched, right? And they're, they're coming out, and, and there is a solution for that. But like you said, it's critical. You know, it's always that it's always that arms race, and uh, how quickly people can patch. And, and rest assured, like always, cyber criminals and attackers are going to be looking at this and trying to figure out the best way to exploit it. Um, there was one particular CVE I want to talk about: two thousand twenty-two two one nine zero seven. Uh, which was of concern. This was a CVSS 9.8. We released a threat signal on it. Uh, this was a wormable remote code execution. Those are two words you do not want to see beside each other uh, because that's a deadly combo. Uh, 
But the good news is the patch is available, and we have not seen exploits in the wild uh, about, uh, from this yet. Yeah. So, uh, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned like the scariest words for every stock uh, analyst that's out there is wormable remote code execution. You never want to see that. Uh, obviously, remote code execution means that it can, you know, attackers can use this exploit remotely. They don't have to be on the local network. They don't have to be local to the machine. They can do this over the internet or like, you know, potentially over the internet. And wormable means that it really can propagate with very to no user interaction as well. So once this attack occurs, it can like spread out for entire organizations. Uh, very, very scary, as, as you said. And, uh, you know, it's basically using web protocols to like, propagate this. And, uh, and, you know, you don't just have to have a web server to use web protocols. Remember, like, just a lot of just communications these days is happening over HTTP, HTTPS. So, uh, uh, like you said, luckily, I think so far, we haven't seen any, any type of, uh, uh, you know, big attacks in the wild where proof of concepts are coming out. And I, I think it remains to be seen what happens with some of the proof of concept. Yeah, I think that's been the good news is even even going back to Log4j and the, and the Mirai reports, we have not seen a truly, we haven't seen anything like WannaCry yet, right? If we look back on the, on the Eternal Blue stuff. So that's that's the good news. And the other the other piece of good news is so there's a lot of visibility on this. So of course we have all the protections in place. We're monitoring this all the time, adding more protections. And it really, the more time goes on, it puts the attackers at a disadvantage here, right? Because we're really, um, you know, having a lot of preparation. We've we've even, um, you know, an, uh, another piece to this on the threat hunt part, well, 40 Guard Labs has already deployed uh, traps out there in terms of honey plots. 40 Deceptor has a specific, uh, you know, a feature for this too, to be able to look for and trap attack activity using decoys, right? So that even if there was a successful breach into a decoy network, that's the whole point, of course, it doesn't matter uh, because it is a decoy. <laughs> it's not a legitimate production system that's being here, right? Yeah, I'm glad you pointed out. It's actually it's one of the um, you know moments that I have a lot of fun as a researcher to see what kind of real world uh, you know telemetry we're getting, what kind of like real world attacks we're getting. Normally, what we do in honeypots is we build uh, we build these honeypot systems and networks and uh, like basically architectures. And what we do is we have a decoy within these uh, honeypot architectures. And what a decoy really is is think of it as almost as a virtual machine or as a container that we're recording things on and having uh, you know potentially vulnerable systems. Usually, it took a very long time, had to think about it, have to figure out where are you going to put these out on the internet, where you're going to get the most impact, how are you going to actually collect information and logs and review everything in a safe and secure manner from these machines. Um, pretty difficult to do. Um, uh, one thing I got to hand it uh, to our 40 Deceptor team is they understand threat hunting. They understand like how researchers work and they're like, let us make this easy for you. Let us do custom decoys. So in the new version, uh, you know, they, you, you have that click and it makes our job a lot easier. And that's exactly what we do. We did that with Log4j, putting in Minecraft servers and other types of vulnerable servers to just see what type of attacks we're going to get. And now we can do it with uh, this uh, Honeypot system as well. Yeah, it's not just great for research, but it really is a mitigation strategy too, right? Because if they're hitting the wrong spot, they're not hitting the right spot and you're effectively slowing them out. I actually talked about this at RSA in a presentation years ago, right? It's an effective tool to slow the attacker down and, and definitely to be able to trap them, but get intelligence at the same time. So it's a win-win situation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, great stuff. Thanks, Amar, as always, for your thoughts and time. And uh, rest assured, Log4j, Latest patch Tuesday, everything. We're continuing to track all of these. Check in on uh, blog.49.com for any security research updates on this. As I said, we are continuing to follow this as usual, 24 7, 365. Um, Derek Mankey with uh, 40 Guard Labs signing off. Thank you.